How are you, Mark? Besides, besides freezing your rear end off in Dallas, man. You know, another day in COVID paradise, waiting for the shit to end, like everybody else, man. God bless, man. Well, I mean, you were you were kind of at the uh, our biggest story of the week this week involved you, so I figured <laughs> we'd start the damn show with it, man. Uh, sure, whatever you want. Can you kind of unfold some of the the national anthem stuff for me? Because I was like, sure. I, I've heard like eight versions of the story, and I, I don't know which of them is right. Well, all I said, just so you know, the only thing I said publicly was con- was confirming that we had not played it for the first 12 games okay. um, when we didn't have fans. I never said we weren't going to play it. I never, you know, cancel it. That's all nonsense, right? So here, here's how it all came together. I- I'm a national anthem guy, right? I mean, my dad was mil- my dad was in the Navy, fighting two wars, was wounded. My uncle flew Air Force, and just you know, the way I was raised. You know, you respect everybody and their beliefs, but, you know, you stand and put your hand over your heart. That's just it. You know, you don't force anybody else to do anything. Um, And so over the 20 years I've owned the Mavs, you know, here in Dallas and traveling around the league, you know, as Rob will tell you, when when they're playing the national anthem, it's not like people rush to their seats to be there to stand up with their hands over their hearts, right? They don't get there on time. They walk around the concourse, you know, you walk, you, I, I intentionally over the years have gone on concourses, you know, at our games and at football games, wherever, and just look to see if anybody stopped, you know, put the hot dog down, put the beer down. Some people do, most don't. There's people who don't, you know, they don't rush back to their seats. Some don't even take their hats off. And, and that bothered me, right? And then over, you know, the last four years, really, you know, as, as I've really listened to, to people, particularly, you know, African-American players talk about, what the anthem does or doesn't mean to them, it, it started to take on new meaning. You know, there was there was a point in time, and you know, 2005, we had a player, and I don't want to mention his name because it'll just you know get him involved all over again, right? Who said the national anthem didn't represent him, and you know, and he got crushed. And when I said I supported him, I got crushed. I got emails saying, "End this, end this, you end lover this, you end lover, lover that." And I wrote a blog post that I've since taken down because I posted the names and email addresses of the people who said all that Mm -hmm. and people went looking for them. Right. And I don't want somebody to get, you know, to get hurt and people got fired and all this stuff. And so, you know, and fast forward to the bubble and people were weaponizing the American anthem. Right. And so it wasn't, about, okay, you love your country the way you choose, you know, because that's what liberty is all about. I love my country. I get to choose how I love it, right? You don't get to tell me that. That's liberty, right? Correct. I get to love my country how I see fit. And so going into this season, there were questions. Would guys kneel? Would guys stand? Would it be a hand over the heart? Whatever. And I thought, you know what? I, I talked to the NBA. I said, look, we are not. We don't have fans. And I know when we get fans, we'll have to play the national anthem but we don't have fans. So I'm not going to play. And they said effectively, okay, well, you're the one owner that kid that's willing to try that stuff and is willing (laughs) to take the heat. So let's see what happens. And so I didn't play it. And we told the first game, we told the other team, it was preseason game. Forget who it was. We told them we weren't going to be playing. No need to line up. Right. And okay. Second game, we told them no one said a word, you know, third game. And we're telling media and everybody. So, you know, no one said a word. And then literally I forgot <laughs> because it just became <laughs> normal. And so, you know, 12, 13th game in, somebody noticed. And it wasn't like we weren't ever going to play the anthem, but then all of a sudden the, the shit storm hit. Um, but, you know, the behind it was more, look, if people, if it wasn't important enough for people to show up in time for it, right. If it's weaponized so that people, you know, that, that love their country differently than, you know, you may love your country, you know, get hate, get hated because of it. Um, let's see what happens if we don't play it. And if anybody noticed, you know, because if they didn't get there in time, if they don't care enough to show up in time or to stop walking on the concourse, I bet they're not even going to notice it's missing. And for the most part, you know, and, and we didn't have fans, but for the most part, that's what's happened. That's what happened. And then all of a sudden, you know, when everybody started finding out that we hadn't played it because a reporter realized, accidentally realized that um, that we hadn't been playing it, that's when everything hit last week. And, you know, to me, the moral of the story is this, this country is defined, you know, by liberty. 
And liberty means you have the right to love this country as you see fit. And not you, not me, not anybody has the right to tell somebody, you know, how to love this country. I mean, you can say whatever you want, right? Yeah. But when we start questioning, you know, how each other loves this country, that's what divides us. It's not, okay, we got to play the anthem because the reality, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm geeky, right? So when all this stuff starts <laughs> happening and we're looking into it, I'm getting online and I'm, you know, and I already knew the history of Francis Scott Key and how he, you know, was pro-slavery, slavery effectively. And the words of the, you know, the second, third and fourth verses talking about slaves and free men, right? And, you know, that's, you know, you know, very, not just disappointing, but it's wrong. Um, so I knew that history part, but I wanted to find out, you know, where people really experience the national anthem. Because if this is supposed to be such, you know, the song that brings us together, everybody should be experiencing it somewhere, right? Well, if you think about it, other than military events and sporting events, where, well, you know, if you haven't gone to a sporting event, when was the last time you were there when they played the anthem? And I looked it up, only 34% of Americans go to sporting events. And you figure another 10% are connected to the military somehow for military events, right? So where are, you know, the other 50 plus percent experiencing the anthem? They're probably not. And then there's some, you know, some sporting events, you'll see the anthem on television, right? And I asked some people, you stand up when the anthem plays on television? No, of they course probably not. probably don't. They probably go no. get a beer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Nobody. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, I wanted, it was, it was kind of a social experiment, a personal experiment. I wanted to see if anybody cared. Because it bothered me that people didn't care enough, right? And it bothered me that people were weaponizing it and trying to force their version of patriotism on other people when the ultimate definition of liberty is being able to love this country as you see fit. And all these people that they're saying don't love their country, I mean, you wouldn't even believe the emails I got, um, that don't love their country, 99.99% uh, of the Americans in this country do love this country. You know, if you didn't care, if you didn't love this country, you wouldn't say anything. You just wouldn't give a damn, right? right. You just ignore the whole thing. Yeah. And, and so, you know, all this hypocrisy and all this, you know, just anger and pretending that, you know, this is supposed to be a song that unifies us when the reality is what, what sets us, what really divides us is that people try to force their version of patriotism on other people. So that that's kind of the background on it. Yeah, for me, uh, it's, it's you know we both got a little background. My dad spent twenty five plus years in the military. He was in the army, and I remember going to an event. Uh, it was a boxing match because uh, that's one of the things that he and I will always share when the end of the season. We would go to a boxing match in Vegas, and I remember the the, the anthem was played, and he stopped, and he just stood there, and people kept walking, and you could see that he was like a little upset that people didn't appreciate it, you know? And for me, that was a moment that I realized that it's in my dad's heart, what he did in Vietnam to go out and fight for this country when the country didn't fight for him at the time and put him in a position to succeed, but he still fought for this country because he did it not for himself. He did it for, you know, his, his wife at the time, my mother, me, and for my kids and the kids on, that's what he was fighting for. And I sure. think a lot, and I think, also, he was fighting for the freedom of speech. And that's one of the things that people sometimes forget, like, you know, the freedom of speech part in my mind, because there's times when people say, OK, you can't say that, but I have the freedom of speech. It might not be right and you might not like it, but I have the right to say it. And that's what makes this country so great that we have the ability to come out and say what we want to say, you know, and I don't think people should get mad. You should just step back and listen to people. You know, some people say some crazy stuff and off the wall stuff and you shouldn't listen to that. But a lot of times when you see people in bad positions, they're trying to get into a better position. They're speaking from the heart. They're speaking from what has affected them and just open up and listen and don't be closed minded. And I think with this whole anthem stuff, people became closed minded and didn't want to listen because my dad, he says, I hear what they're saying. And I know what they're saying. I respect what they're saying, but you know it, it doesn't bother me because I know what I did for this country. I fought for this country. I laid my life on the line for this country. And you just got to sit back and say what's best for you and what you think at that time. And he said, you know, hey, it's a it's a peaceful protest. You're hearing what they have to say, so I'm good with it. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, 
we say in liberty and justice for all. Correct. Right. We, we, you know, the Pledge of Allegiance was supposed to mean something, but that word out of the schools. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> can't do that anymore. Yeah. yeah but even so. Right. I mean, liberty is supposed to be a foundation for this country. Right. You have the liberty to, you know, to practice whatever religion you want to practice. We don't look and say, OK, that's not the right way to do religion. Right? Well, yeah. some people. Do, right. Yeah. But you some get people your do. Choice, right. Yeah. You get your choice. And it's the same way with loving your country. Instead of saying, you know, why don't you, you know, why don't you approach the anthem the exact same way as I do? Just ask the question. Do you love your country? Yes or no? Yes. And then 99 percent of people are going to say yes. You know, do you want do you do you have a vision for this country where you think you can make it better? Yes. Otherwise, you wouldn't do anything. and We wouldn't be having this conversation. Right. You know, if you didn't care, we wouldn't be talking about it. We don't talk about the things we don't care about. And, and so when when we weaponize the anthem, that just really bothered me. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of people, my dad included, who, who thought the anthem was special um, and it shouldn't be played all the time. You know, it was meant yeah. for special events. And, you know, it's just, you know, it's OK. We're having this conversation. And like I, I said to Adam, when, when we, you know, when we talked about it, it was like at least it wasn't because somebody got shot. You know, at least we're having this conversation because we want to have this conversation. And yeah, people are yelling and people are angry, but at least we're having the conversation and it's not about some tragedy. Yeah. yeah. What was Adam's position on it when you guys had that conversation? Was he, was I mean, he, okay he was like, doing it? what's that? Was he okay with you doing it? Not playing it? Well, no, he was like, look, there's no fans, so we can try different things, but the, when there's going to be fans, we're going to have to play it, you know? And I'm <laughs> like, okay, well, let's just see what happens. And he was like, okay, well, you're the one owner that can probably deal with the, <laughs> you know, what's going to come your way. A kick back and, if you and I'm like, yeah. And yeah. I'm like, okay, I can deal with that. Um, and we'll play it when we have fans. And look, by the way, we've been playing it the last three days and last three games, and we don't have paying fans yet. We're only letting healthcare workers, military and first responders that have been vaccinated. Those are the people that are coming in. And, and so, you know, but we still started playing it. Good for you. Do you know a timeline? Do you guys have a timeline on when you're going to start letting fans in in general? Um, or are we still too far out? The number out? of cases in Dallas has gone down from like three to 4,000 a day to 750. And so that's why we started letting some fans in. Okay. Um, and now with the number of people being vaccinated going up, we figured we'd test it by letting, you know, like I said, military first responders, et cetera, that have been vaccinated. So that gives us a chance to get things together. Um, and so we're, we're, we're going to try to increase the numbers that we let in um, each, each game. We'll add more and more and more. And hopefully as we get towards the end of the season, there'll be enough people who have been vaccinated. Not that we're only going to let vaccinated people in, but it'll feel a lot safer and we can create yeah. uh, and we can allow in a lot more people. <clears throat> Those courtside seats open up again. Yeah, where'd you come from? He's been here. Actually, talking about the anthem, I, uh, I was letting you roll with that. But uh, when LeBron had that incident with the fan who was sitting courtside in Atlanta, the courtside yeah, parent. I we don't have that. Why do you think that? Well, you guys have one pesky fan I know about. But are, do you think that fans, as they come back in, should be that close to the court and, and the players? Well, once. I mean, right now we're still figuring things out. So no, they're not that close to the court, right? They're at least 10 feet away. Um, but going forward, yeah, we're going to get there, right? Hopefully sooner rather than later. And, and so, um, you know, it, it's going to happen, but I think, you know, we're really trying to push and get people vaccinated. And as that, those numbers increase, then yeah, we're, you know, cause we want to get, you know, if the trade-off is, you know, dealing with unruly fans, then we'll kick out the unruly <laughs> fans because we want to get things back to normal as much as possible. And not so much from a revenue perspective, is it, from yeah. just make the country better, you know, make things better perspective. Back to normal. Yeah. I thought unruly fans were a part of the game. That would make it special, man. You had to have someone oh, you can man. pick out in the crowd and talk trash to. <laughs> no doubt. But on no the other, doubt, right? But, yeah. you know, there's a line but, you can't cross, right? Yeah. And it's not like players yeah, so don't true. talk yeah. back. It's exactly. not like players don't talk back, right? You know, you know that, right? I think the players love the fact that, okay, you said something like, get him out of here. You know, that's the power <laughs> of the players. You know, you, you mentioned Adam Silver earlier, and um, I've always enjoyed the conflict between you and David Stern. You know, yeah. you know God rest his soul. And so is it a different relationship? It seems like it's a more uh, 
uh, bending situation with Adam. Adam seems like he bends more for the players and for yeah. the owners. But uh, with David Stern was more stricter. So yep. is is it true that Adam is is a little bit a little bit more of a joy to work with? You know, I'm not saying anything bad about David Stern. No, no, look, look he David and I, yeah. David <laughs> I just and used I got to love the conflicts y'all you had. <laughs> yeah, yeah. David and I got along great, right? So <laughs> what happened outside in the media and the fines or anything was totally different how we were one on one. Right. Because mm -hmm. we, we both had it, it's almost like the anthem thing. Right. We both had the best interest of the NBA. Now, we we disagreed on how to get there a lot. Right. A lot. Yeah. Oh, I but, did too agree. I, I agree with you on a lot of things you would say it. <laughs> right. And, and so, um, you know, we disagreed on a lot of stuff, but we both had the best interest of the NBA. Now, with Adam, you know, Adam took over, you know, oh shit, sorry. <laughs> oh. And he's gone, just like that. Oh no, it's <laughs> random. Yeah, no. <laughs> random, yeah, mm -hmm. random. Um, yeah, but Adam Adam is a little bit more bending. He's a little bit more open-minded than David was. David had his vision where it's like, this is the way we have to do it, right? And that's why we conflicted more because, mm -hmm. you, know, when, you know, when he was set in stone on things and I was like, yo, it's not 1985 anymore, David, yeah, you know? Yeah. And, and so I was trying to push things, you know, when I was the young guy, just <laughs> raising hell. But now people are used to me too, right? It's yeah. just like, you know, I've been, I've been doing the same things for 20 years. Like even the refs don't even look at me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny because the NBA is, is, is a revolving door. And I mean, it's always trending, think new things because, as an analyst now, I look at the way the NBA's play, and sometimes I shake my head. You know, when the guys come down, they're shooting, like, for instance, I think uh, Denver shot 59 threes last night. And yeah. I'm saying, shit, we can shoot 59 shots total in a game, you know, some games. Yeah, so I know. It's, it's, just, it's, it's, a, it's a different game. And and I know my skill set would have been better for this, this game yeah. than it was then because the first thing they told me to do was get bigger, get stronger. And now it's like they're saying get leaner, get faster. Yep. And so my, my point is, you have one of my best friends working for you, Michael Finley. I love him to death. Yeah, Finn, I know oh. you guys sit around and talk about it. So how, how, how do you relate the two? Which one do you like better? Because you won a championship the old way. Yeah, the old way, yeah. <laughs> well, what's, what's changed, Rob, is that, you know, used to be like when you were playing, if someone shot 40% from three, they're knocked down, right? Now, you know, and if guys, you, you'd see some guys in a gym, if, if there was nobody in the gym by themselves, they couldn't shoot 40% on threes. Yeah. Now, everybody practices threes, right? Everybody knows that that's where the money's at mm -hmm. and that you don't have to be the biggest, strongest, fastest. If you can knock down a shot like that, you know, you're going to get paid. And so kids coming in today can all, for the most part, can all shoot or they're going to work on that part of their game. And because that opens up the court even more and what's even crazy. So like back in 2012, I'll never forget. I tried to tell Dirk, I'm like, Dirk, look, when we look at you shooting two feet behind the three point line, right? Two feet behind it, you shoot 50%. And he's like, really? I'm like, cause no one guards you back there. Yeah. Right. No one, you know, when you guys were coming up, right. You didn't, you guarded up to the three point line cause you wanted to make it as crowded as possible. Now guys can shoot a foot, two, three, four feet, you know, or more beyond that line. And that creates more space. And the more three point shooters you have, the more space everybody has. So if we've got, you know, if we play five out and give Luca the ball, he's going wherever he wants. You give Jokic the ball and people cut from five out, you know, there's space everywhere. But if, you know, if the team's packing it in and daring you to shoot, you know, 59 threes, we would take that all day long. Now, you know, Sometimes when those threes aren't falling for both teams, it looks really, really ugly. <laughs> yes, right? it does. Yes. Yeah. Right? Because, but you the know? thing about that, and then they have no other choice because they're like, well, we don't work on anything else. Well, they we live and die by that. Yeah. They live and die by <laughs> it. It's not even that you don't work on it, right? It's just that, you know, you're, the guys just aren't prepared to do it, right? Like, we'll post up, like, we'll post up Luca, you know, and we got Boban who's, you know, who's trying to shoot threes, but he's going right by the bucket. <laughs> um, you know, so, you know, it's just, you, you can do it the other way, but then, you, you know, because you never know when you're going to get hot, right? So you might have missed those first 33s. Like, you know, we've had, you've had nights when you're three for 29, right? right? But, you know, the next one's going in, and that changes the game. And really the way it's played out, the teams that make the most threes, even if you're a bad team, if you make the most threes, you're going to win. 
Now in the playoff series, you know, the better team is probably going to make those threes more often, but you know, now there's 20, 30, 40 guys shooting 40% or better from three. And that's really the basis of what's changed. And you've got to be able to get those guys open. And the other way to really get those guys open is to, you know, play high pick and roll or to spread out and, and let them go one-on-one to have somebody drive and kick. And that's where you would have been good, right? Because you can play pick and roll and, and you can drive and kick and, you know, you can finish if you've got space and you'd be running, right? I mean, you'd be out there yeah. running and finishing. And, you know, that's, that's what teams try to do these days. And, you know, and when a team is making them like Denver, yeah, doesn't matter who it is. I mean, <laughs> Detroit yeah. beats, you know, um, who was it? The, maybe it was the Lakers. I forget. And they had Sadiq Bay, the rookie go seven for seven. Yes. When somebody's yes. knocking them down, they're knocking them down. Right. And yeah. you're, you're not going to beat them. Uh, you brought up Luca before. Uh, what kind of kid is he, man? He he just seems like he's got one of those kids that could be the future of the league in the way he presents himself, his personality, the fun he has playing the game, behind the scenes, off the court. What kind of kid is he? Good kid, man. Great guy. Great, great. Funny as hell, right? <laughs> Loves, you know, Serbian 1980s rock and roll, you know. Um, <laughs> wow. Just, you know, he just, he's his own man, man. He just, but he loves kids. He loves having fun got the big smile all the time always you know we'll hang out and talk to anybody you know kids shooting on the court he's gonna you know go shoot with them and have fun with them just doesn't have that attitude like it's you know my way only it's just you know just you, you just want to hang out and have a drink with them and it, it's, it's great <laughs> he's, just, he's just a really really good kid he saves it uh one of my favorite things you did with your uh recently we were talking about the um Wall Street madness that's been going on with all the doggy yeah. coin and Bitcoin and who's buying GameStop and why do people own AMC? But one of my favorite things that you did was you got your kids involved, which I thought was awesome. What are you doing with your kids? Yeah. So, you know, my son, it's funny, like I, my kids are 11, 14 and 17 now, and they're all on TikTok. Right. And they get all their information on TikTok. And by the way, I'm M Cuban That's on dangerous. TikTok. So, so, no, it's actually not bad, you know. So, but if you want to see me dance in my thousand dollar pants, a whole lot of chopping going on. <laughs> Why are we not looking at this right now? M Cuban on M, M Cuban on TikTok. Um, I had to look so that up. Yeah. But so there's the fun dance part of TikTok, but it's kind of become the social network for kids, and he watches a lot of business videos. He's 11, right? And, and even, wow. <laughs> yeah. It, but that's where he gets his information. It's crazy, crazy. Like you can't get him to read a book, but kids these days will watch <laughs> videos to learn instead. And that's yes. not a bad thing I'm figuring out as long as they're learning. As long as they're learning. Yeah. And, and so I started, you know, he started asking me about Dogecoin, which I call doggy coin too. Yeah, we're and, you know, and, and so I said, well, if you want to learn about this, let I'll set up an account for you and I'll trade for you. Right. You tell me what you want to do. And so we set up an account and um, he bought some AMC, which went up and down. And I tried to explain to him, you know, supply and demand, you know, this is why the stock's going up and down. He made a little money there. He bought a share of Sony and a share of Disney and he made some money there. But now he's got 500 <laughs> shares of doggy coin, right? For 500 doggy coins, which he bought his first ones he bought for under a penny. And now they're up to like five and a half cents each but they did go up to eight for eight cents each. So he was really excited, but now he's underwater because he bought more when the price was higher. So, oh. you know, you know, but he, he spent maybe $30 <laughs> on Dogecoin. And so in total, and, and so I'm like, this is how you learn about the markets. This is how you learn why stocks go up and down. This is how you feel the joy of when it goes up and the pain of when it goes down, you know, this is where your allowance goes now. And, and so, um, it, he gets an allowance. Yeah, he gets a little allowance. I make my kids work for their money. My, oh, you know, my wife's. You have my to. Wife you have them, to. Yeah, my wife slips them some money that pisses me off. But uh, <laughs> you know, I, you know, if you want something, I, same way my dad did to me. You want something, you got to go get a job and earn it. Exactly. Work for it, man. Work for I it. tell my son that all the time. <laughs> and how's that going, Rob? Actually, it's, it's going good. You should see him. He has a. A stack in his room, like a, a hundreds, and believe it or not, during the pandemic, my wife and I was Wait, going to the bar and 
He got so much money, man. So we was what? going to borrow money yeah. from him at times. He like, uh uh-uh, no. your house. And he starts he start charging us interest too. We don't pay him back at a certain time. <laughs> I'm like, oh, are you serious, dude? Like, the other day he got mad because we was like, okay, it's a little little corner store. It's like just walk down and get you something to eat. So out of the blue, he goes and comes back. He says, Well, you didn't ask us. We wanted to, y'all didn't pay for it. So I just went on my own. I'm like, okay, okay, I see how it works. I see. But he is he is really it, it's so it's so weird because our kids today are so smart. My son was really into politics in the past years. He's really into Black Lives Movement. He even, he's really into uh, everything that's I would call adult nature because at his age, at 15 years old, I didn't care about politics. All I care about was when is a new video game coming out? When are we going to play basketball? When are we going to play any type of sport? And so these kids nowadays, because of the social media, because of the electronics, they're so astute. They know everything. And so it, you just have to sit back and learn from them because I learn from my kids every day. Every day, man. It's always changing and they're one step ahead. That's why it's hard. You're like, I'm a tech guy, so I got to keep up, right? Yeah, you, yeah, know, you I definitely got to keep up. Yeah, you, I can't let them show me up. So I got to stay <laughs> one step ahead. That's why I know my TikTok moves. <laughs> exactly. I'm going to take financial planning from Ori and Cuban's kids. Right? Yeah, for real. What are we doing? We're doing it all wrong. I know. All right, Mark, we know you got a lot going on, so we're going to let you bounce, but um, we really, really appreciate it. And uh, uh, Mark, appreciate it, guys. We, Mark, I always, I had to have, you know, have to ask one question before uh, I have to say every time. I, I don't know, but I, I, before this, though, I always want to say, I want to say this too. I want to say thank you for the opportunity to sign with you guys. I don't know if you remember that, but it was right after my 2005 championship with the Spurs. Uh, yep. My people reached out to you and you offered more money to come play for you guys than I did with the Spurs, but I stayed with the Spurs. And I don't know if you even remember that. You told my representative that, oh, I can respect that. I appreciate him saying that, you know, he's in a system now. He could come make more money, but he he feel like he has a system, yep. you know? And so and what happened to... in 2006, though? <laughs> yeah. oh. Hey, what happened in 2007, though? <laughs> yeah, we, were, yeah I know, I know, I know. we don't talk about that. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, and I just I just love, I always had a respect for you, and I had a love for you. So my question is, when are you running for president, man? Come on. Not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to happen. Never. Because you have to give up the Dallas Mavericks, and I know. No, you know, not even, not even, man. It's just. <laughs> When, when Trump was out there, then I thought about it and talked about it. But, yeah, that's just not going to happen. All right. All right. I, oh, I forgot. And also, since you're a Texas guy now, um, can you go buy the Texans, please? No, man. Oh, no. man. You One got the money. No. You One got the money. No. <laughs> but I get asked, well, with all that stuff with JJ going on, now I, I get asked that all the time. But no, not going to happen. Yeah, come on. Uh, just, just loan me the money and I'll go buy them. How about that? <laughs> there you go. I got you. That works. Jamie, what? Jamie, I've never heard you so quiet. Uh, well, I'm listening to uh, the greats here, so. <laughs> I, I'm the same way. <laughs> Come on, Jamie, say something. <laughs> yeah. She's good. She threw in. Do, let me ask you this, if you don't mind. And I know sure. you, know, you get going, but I wanted to ask earlier, like, do you think, because also my, my both grandfathers served in the military. My father uh, was in Vietnam. My, my brother was in Afghanistan. So I have a special reverence during the national anthem. I, sure. I Sing along with it. For me, it's almost like a, a quiet moment of, of reflection before the game starts and right. you know, things get crazy. I, I appreciate it. However, I also question, you know, like why do we play it at right. sporting events? There's no good reason. I mean, if you look at the history of it, um, like the Mavs from 1980 to 1996 did not play the national anthem. We played God Bless America. And it wasn't until the original owners, the Carters, sold it that they started to play it. The Cubs didn't play it till 1967. MLS didn't play it during their bubble this summer. UFC doesn't play it because Dana White thought it was bad luck, right? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, not no, bad luck, not because he dis dismissed the anthem, but because the first uh, pay-per-view fight he had, the anthem caused them to run over and their pay-per-view window ended, right? And so it's not like we have to do it, it you know, and you know, 34% of people really, you know, when someone gets into an argument with you about the anthem, ask them when the last time they heard it, not at a sporting or military event. It's just people 
you know, talk like it's the most important thing, but they don't, they don't show that in terms of their actions, you know, and that's, that's so disappointed because look, I can, whether it's the national anthem or another song, right. That we can all rally behind. I think that would be great. You know, my country tis of the America, the beautiful, this land is your land, whatever. It'd be great if there was something that we all got behind, but the reality is it's still just a song, you know, and we don't play that song when people, other people go to work. We don't think it's so important that the people who don't experience it ha should be, should hear it all the time. Right. We don't find ways to make sure everybody in this country hears it. And so I agree with you. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, know why we make such a big deal of it i mean we could just have you know one minute where people face the flag and think whatever they want to think you know it's just the anthem was not the, the and the anthem wasn't always the anthem right it wasn't until 1931 that the star spangled banner became the national anthem before that they used to play either uh, my country tis of or this other song called hail columbia song I'd never heard of. And then when I went online to listen to it, I still had never heard it. And that's what they played all the time. And so, you know, we, we make this big deal because we try to, we, some people want everybody to love this country the way they do. And I think that's, that's the unfortunate thing. You know, we're, we're so, we're so blessed to have the liberties that we do, but you know, we can't, create these false equivalencies that either you love it the way I do, or, or you're, you're not, you're a communist. That's why I, I can't tell you, I got hundreds of emails calling me a communist. How this all turned me into a communist, the number one capitalist that you've ever met. I have no <laughs> idea. Did you get more support than you did, you know, communist comments? Communist comments? The people that were, were against you not playing the anthem, were there more of those or were there more, more people that were saying, hey, you know what, you're onto something? You know what's crazy? Depends on their color and how old they are. Uh -huh. If they were white and older, I was a communist. If they were people of color, it was a thank you. Mm. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. I guess it makes sense. All right, and Mark, we, we'll let yes. you run, man. We Again, we appreciate your time thank, so much. Thank you, Mark. Always, Good man, luck. I enjoyed you're always it. so great. great we appreciate you. Guys. you. Thank Always you, Mark. a pleasure. We appreciate it. All Good right, luck Mark. the rest of the season. I'll take it. Hey, more importantly, stay healthy. Stay, stay healthy because that. that's y'all. That's y'all problem. Stay healthy. Yep. Appreciate it, guys. Take care. All right, Mark. All, All right. the best, sir.